Well, hello guys. So today we're going to look at the planes of the body and the movements that occur at joints. So when it comes to the planes and the joints and all this movement and everything, it all works together. So joints will move their joint, their bones will move and the movement occurs in the plane. The origination of the movement comes in at an axis. So we have these planes, which are like imaginary panes of glass that cut our body into certain parts. And then those axes come in at a perpendicular angle. So for instance, just to kind of summarize, we're not going to get into too much detail about it. We have a plane that's going to run straight forward and backward. So we run straight forward and backward. And the movement of the joint, so for instance, my shoulder, the movement's going to occur in this front to back plane here, but then I'm going to take a pin to basically hold the joint in place, and that's where the movement's going to originate from. So here's the pin, this is where the joint, the, orig the movement originates from, but then the movement is occurring in that plane. So I know it seems a little complicated and complex right now, we're not going to get into too much joints, but we're going to pay attention to the planes. As we said, they're imaginary panes of glass that are dissecting the body into certain parts. So the first plane we're going to look at is what we call the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane cuts us into left and right parts. Now, there's a few uh, variations to the sagittal plane. So first off, we know that our body is relatively symmetrical. And now, if this sagittal plane were to cut us into equal left and right parts down the midline of the body, we'd say, we call that the mid-sagittal line. And then any other sagittal line off from the mid-sagittal is what we call parasagittal. Para meaning alongside. The next plane we're going to look at is going to be the frontal plane. This one's very easy to remember because it's going to divide our body into front and back parts. So this plane is going to slice Mr. Bones here at the side. So it's going to run straight this way and it's going to cut Mr. Bones into the side. So it can cut him here, it can cut him here, it can cut him here. So basically we take him through a little meat slicer and just cut little slices of Mr. Bones off. The next plane we're going to look at is going to be the transverse plane. So the transverse plane, transverse meaning across, this runs across the body. So it's going to run straight across here. Imagine the floor that you're standing on. The floor is a nice flat plane. And if we were to take that floor and just levitate it and lift it up, and the floor would still be like this, that's our transverse plane. So the transverse plane is going to basically chop off Mr. Bones' head. So it separates us into what we call top and bottom parts, or superior and inferior margins. The next plane we're going to look at is a very interesting plane because there's no real specificity into which degree or which uh, movement occurs here because the angle can be very varying. But this plane occurs at an angle and it's oblique. So we all understand, we know we have the ob oblique muscles in our abs, that's because they run at angles. So the oblique plane, allows for this angular movement here. So like we said, the movement of joints occur in the plane, and then the movement originates at the axis. So when it comes to a joint, it can have one movement, which means, um, or move in one plane of the body, which means uniplanar, or it can move in two planes of the body, biplanar, or it can move in multiple planes of the body for multiplanar. Now, if it's a, a uniplanar joint, it usually only has one axis for it. So that gives us a uniaxillar joint. If it has two planes, then we have a biaxillary joint. Then if it has multiple planes, then we have a tri or multiaxillary joint of the body. So let's kind of just put that all together and look at some of these movements and define these movements. Now first, we're going to use the biggest example here, one of the most movable joints of the body, our shoulder, our glenohumeral joint more specifically, and then we're going to look at the whole shoulder complex for the rest of most of the rest of our movements here. So when it comes to the joint, the first and easy or shoulder joint here, the first easy ones to look at are flexion and extension. So by definition, flexion is in decrease in an angle and extension is an increase in an angle. So I'm sure everybody is probably aware of your angles and your joints and, uh, and, and measurements of geometry. So if we were to take 
Mr. Bones here, and we have this straight 180 degree plane. So on this end, we have zero. On the opposite end, we have 180, right? We all understand that. And then our arm hanging down makes a 90 degree angle. So if we were to take our arm and go from 90 degrees towards that zero, we're now decreasing the angle and we're going to be flexing. And then if we go from 90 degrees to 180, then we're going to be increasing the angle and we're going to be extending. So we have extension. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the shoulder, we can turn our shoulder in and we can turn our shoulder out. We turn our shoulder in, we turn our shoulder out, we turn our shoulder in and then we shake it all about. That's what we're talking about here. So we have internal rotation and external rotation. Or we could also call it medial rotation for turning inward or lateral rotation for turning outward. Medial meaning more towards the midline, lateral meaning out towards the side. So internal rotation, medial rotation, turning, turning into the body, turning towards the midline of the body, or lateral rotation, external rotation, turning outward or outside of the body. So then we have what we call adduction and abduction. Now pay very close attention to this because most people will say adduction or abduction because that tiny little one letter difference between the two makes a huge difference in what we're talking about. So we can look at it, if we have the B in there, we have abduction, we can think like subtraction. So subtraction means you're taking away from something. So if we have our arm here by our side, that means we're taking away from the midline of the body and coming out towards the side. So abduction means to take away from the midline of the body. Adduction means to bring it back to the body. Adduction like addition, we're adding to the body. So when it comes to adduction and abduction, we have a few types of adduction and abduction. So one of which is horizontal adduction and abduction. So if our arm is out to the side and we bring our arm in as if we're giving someone a hug, that's horizontal adduction. And then if we bring it back, psych, then we have horizontal abduction. Now, again, we can have abduction occur in the transverse plane, in our, our oblique plane here. So coming down at an angle. So that oblique plane coming in at an angle is going to give us transverse adduction, transverse abduction. So and then we're going to look at the shoulder blade itself here. So we're going to move into the shoulder complex. I'm going to have to turn Mr. Bones around because I only have a free left-sided shoulder blade here. So when it comes to the um, shoulder blade here, our scapula, there's a few movements that occur that are relatively intrinsic to just this, but we see some in some places, some other areas of the body. So the first one we're going to look at is rotation, but this is a little bit different than the internal external rotation because we're rotating upward or downward. Now, if you look at the scapula, if you look at the shoulder blade, it's almost like a nice little triangle with a finite point. So the orientation of this rotation is going to be which way the point is going. So if we're turning it up, that's upward rotation. If we're turning it down, that's downward rotation. So upward rotation would be if I'm taking my arm up or I'm taking it down. So upward rotation, downward rotation. So then we can lift our shoulder blade up, shrug our shoulders. I don't know, this lecture don't make sense. So shrug our shoulders up, that's elevation. Or bring them down, and that's depression. So elevate like an elevator lifts you up, or depression like you're down in the dumps and sad, and you're down and depressed. Don't do that. So the next thing we're gonna look at with the <clears throat> shoulder blade is going to be tilting. Now tilting is the intrinsic part to the shoulder blade itself and this allows the just like we're playing pinball right if you're playing pinball tick, 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 and you try to tilt the machine to get the pinball to move in certain directions and whatnot or get it unstuck most of the time get it unstuck then that means you're shifting side to side so that's exactly what's occurring here with the shoulder blade so we can lift the sh one edge we can lift that medial border off of the rib cage and lift it up or lift other way back or tilt the inferior angle or superior angle up around. So we're basically tilting 
pivoting it around, pick like we picked it up and we're just shifting it around, tilting it on the spot. We typically don't like to have a lot of tilting in the um, scapula itself here. So the next movement we're going to look at here is called deviation. Now, most of these movements do recur at different areas of the body. <clears throat> For instance, your mandible, your temporal mandibular joint can pro Oops, excuse me, I forgot one more about the, uh, the scapula there. So we have what we call protraction retraction. So the mandible itself is also capable of this. So pro protraction means to come forward. So if you're proactive, it means you're outgoing and you're doing things. So protraction means you're coming forward, you're being forward. Retraction, well, you're, you're, you're taking a step back. So this is what's happening here. So with the shoulder blade, protraction would be the shoulder blade coming forward. So I'm uh, coming into a nice bear hug. Or if I'm retracting, I'm like, whoa, I didn't say that, you know. And same thing here with the joint, the mandible joint itself. So protraction would be jutting our jaw forward, getting that nice underbite, and then retracting it, pulling it back for that nice um, overbite there. <clears throat> so protraction, retraction there. So like we said, the mandible, the temporal mandibular joint can do quite a few of those actions we already discussed, such as protraction, retraction. It can do elevation and depression as well. But we're looking at another movement that's uh, a, a tr intrinsic to this joint as well as a few others called deviation. So deviation, if you're deviating from something, it means you're going around. You're going to the side, you're sidestepping, you're going around off to the side. So when it comes to the jaw, deviation is to shift side to side. So that's a uh, 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 nice Jim Carrey <laughs> looking little uh, jaw movement there. So going to the side. Now other joints that can deviate are going to be your wrist. So just like you're waving, the nice Nice little ah, subtle wave like, hey friend, how you doing? So we can have uh, radial deviation and then ulnar deviation. Radial deviation, ulnar deviation. We're deviating from one side to the other. Now, coming to the hand, we have a few movements that can occur here as well. One of which is pretty intrinsic to just the thumb. We have our opposable thumb because our opposable thumb produces this one movement that's pretty intrinsic to itself and no other parts of the body. It's called opposition. So opposition means to come across the hand and to be able to touch the pads of the other fingers. No other digit on your body can touch the pads of the other digits, um, like the thumb can. So try it. Just, just trying to do it, it's racking my brain to get it to do that. It's impossible. But your thumb can safely touch the pads of all those other fingers, and that's what we call opposition. <clears throat> so also with the hand and also with the foot as well we have supination and pronation just like with our clients on a massage table if our client is supinated they're lying on their back facing up if we're pronated we're lying on our bellies face down in the headrest so our hands if we're supinated we're asking for soup our hands are up please sir may I have some more right and then if we're pronated, it means we've lost our soup, our hands are down. We're putting our hands down, we're putting our foot down, right? Now when it comes to the feet, we have the small parts of supination and pronation, which means turning the foot in. So if this is my foot, fl uh, fat, flat on the, on the floor here, and I turn my foot in, we call that inversion. If I turn my foot out, I call that eversion, which again, is still supination, pronation. Those are just parts of supination and pronation, just um, more specific to the foot. <clears throat> um, so when it comes to the trunk of the body, when we have flexion, well, of course, we can have flexion to the front, flexion or an extension to the back, right? But when the trunk of the body itself bends to the sides, we call that lateral flexion. Lateral meaning to the side, lateral flexion. We're flexing to the side, and then we would just denote which side we were flexing to. <clears throat> now, like we said, these movements are going to be pretty intrinsic and specific to the different joints that they occur, and we're obviously going to have to talk about the, each joint and, and see what that movement 
at a specific joint looks like. So for instance, like we said, rotation at the shoulder, well, we have internal, external rotation, but it's gonna change in some uh, areas of the body. For instance, rotating at the uh, intervertebral disc, at the intervertebral joints. We can rotate, right? It's not internal, external, it's just rotating to one side or the other, left or right, right? And it's just a slightly different, but the principle is the same. We're pivoting on the spot and rotating here. Same thing, we can even have rotation, rotational movement, pivoting movement uh, in some other joints as well. Now, some joints are able to make circular movements. So for instance, the shoulder, we all know we can, you know, wind our shoulder around like a windmill, right? So we call that circumduction. But circumduction is just a cumulation of all these other different movements. So we have flexion, we have abduction, we have extension, external rotation, then we have adduction and extension here, internal rotation, back to flexion. So it's just accumulation of you know, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and rotation all occurring together to create this movement there. So that's going to be the gist of these movements. Like I said, we'll have to just go into each and every joint to understand the specificities of those movements to those joints and look at it. So just to just a quick recap here, we have four planes we look at in the body. One's going to cut us into left and right parts, which is the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane can be broken up into straight down the midline for the mid sagittal, cutting us into equal left and right parts, or parasagittal is going to cut us along to the side. We then have the frontal plane, which cuts us into front and back portions, ventral or dorsal portions here. <clears throat> then we have the transverse plane, which cuts us across the body and splits us into superior and inferior margins. Then we have the oblique plane, which comes at an angle and gives us those extra additional whacking movements there. We said that the movements of the joints occur in the planes, but the origination of the movement occurs at the axis, and the axis usually comes in at a perpendicular angle to the plane. We're not gonna to look too much at those axes, but we just have a good understanding of axes existing. So then when it comes to the movements, we said that flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. So flexion is a decrease in an angle, Extension is an in increase in an angle. Now keep in mind too, uh, a, a, an important fact is if a joint can do one action, it has to be able to do the equal and opposite action as well. So for instance, if I, could, if I only could flex my shoulder, then I'm stuck like this and I'm pretty well foobarred, right? And then I, I couldn't be able to extend it. Now, of course, with the exception of a few muscles that can do antagonistic actions to themselves, we're going to have a muscle or muscle groups that will do one action for that joint's movement and then another muscle or muscle groups to do the opposite action as well. But remember, the joint itself can do those actions, but we're going to have specific things, specific muscles in place to do those actions for us. So flexion, decrease in an angle, extension, increase in angle. Abduction, to take away from the midline and come out to the side. Adduction, to increase and bring towards the midline. With adduction and abduction, we have horizontal, which means coming across in that transverse plane here. Or we can have transverse adduction and abduction occurring in the oblique plane. We can have rotation at the shoulder. In this case, at the shoulder, we have internal rotation or medial rotation, turning our arm in. Mm, giving them the cold shoulder or being a waiter and serving we're rotating our shoulder out external rotation or lateral rotation <clears throat> then of course we can combine all of those movements to create circumduction make that circular movement then when we have the shoulder blade the shoulder blade can lift up it can elevate or it can depress to bring down it can rotate upward for upward rotation or it can rotate downward for downward rotation.
then it can also protract, it can come forward, or it can retract and come backward along the spine. Then, of course, it can also tilt, pivoting on itself there. When it comes to the jaw, we can have deviation, which means moving to the side. Again, at the hand, we can deviate as well. So coming to the sides, a little nice little wave, deviation. When it comes to the hands, we can also have supination, which means our palms are up, asking for soup, or pronation, hands are down, no, slamming the hand down on the table. Again, same thing occurs at the foot, but when the foot, a uh, part of supination and pronation for the foot, if the foot were to turn in, that's inversion or supination, or if we turn it out, that's eversion and pronation as well. When it comes to the hand, the thumb is the only joint that can do opposition, which means to come across the hand and touch the pads of the fingers on its, on its own same hand. Alright guys, so we're going to end it there. Hopefully uh, you got the gist of everything here. Like we said, we'll get into the more specificities as we go. But for now, take it easy.